Hi, um, this video is for chapter seven, um, entitled Love and Romantic Relationships. And so the chapter starts off by, you know, asking the question when two people start a romance, is it set off by a mysterious romantic spark? Um, or does romantic attraction have more to do with people sharing similar socioeconomic, racial, educational, and privileged backgrounds? Um, and so, you know, obviously, I, I think in our own lives, in, in a lot of the media we consume, you know, we lean towards that magic spark, right? You know, we the idea of love at first sight, you know, the idea that, you know, everybody has a soulmate and you only have one soulmate, like all of these are kind of, um, you know, uh, beliefs, values within our culture um, that kind of hint at the, the magic and the unknowability uh, behind why we fall in love. Now, you know, hopefully you should know by now that what we do as sociologists is we poke at social phenomena and we try to see if we can make observations about phenomena by looking at the bigger picture. And so that's what your textbook is basically asking of you here, right? Is to take something, you know, that seems extremely personal, very individualistic, you know, like falling in love and who you fall in love with and apply the sociological imagination, which of course, you know, ask you to consider uh, the role of larger social forces uh, and larger, uh, you know, social structures um, and how those things might contribute to, uh, you know, your dating preferences, um, how you initiate romantic relationships, um, you know, what constitutes a romantic relationship in your mind, uh, particularly a successful one, um, and, you know, and how these larger social forces kind of shape, you know, our, our personal and intimate uh, love lives. So let's dive in. Um, the first part of this chapter is called scripting diversity. And so I introduced the concept of sexual scripts um, to the material from uh, chapter six on sexuality. Um, we're going to broaden sexual scripts um, so that it's not just looking at, you know, um, uh, behavior and values kind of and expectations, you know, related to sexual behavior, but broader social behavior. So social scripts are commonly understood patterns of interaction that serve as a model of behavior in familiar situations. So it's how we know um, how to behave in certain situations. Um, and as your book notes, you know, social scripts reassure people that their behavior is understandable and acceptable to others without us having to invent and overthink every single situation. Um, and the absence of scripts, right, when we don't know what's expected of us in a situation, um, this can be very disorienting and confusing. Um, and so when it comes to dating, scripts do exist, but as Cohen notes, they're becoming less clear um, than what they once were. They've become more diverse. And, you know, obviously this means this does introduce a little bit more of that confusion and disorientation because you don't necessarily know when you are pursuing someone, um, when you're going out on a date with someone, when you're in a relationship with someone, you, you know, can't necessarily assume that they have the same expectations, that they have the same interpretation of behaviors and decisions because those scripts are in flux. And so I found this uh, research that, you know, was, was looking at, you know, um, you know, social scripts kind of related to dating versus hanging out versus hooking up. Uh, like, so the t things that people, um, young people kind of associate uh, with one as opposed to the other. Um, and so, you know, Cohen um, has that whole section about this. And you can see that there is some distinction made between uh, the type of behavior that people think is acceptable, you know, and expected on a date versus the type of behavior that in acceptable uh, behavior uh, that's perceived as acceptable uh, on a hookup. And so I thought that was that was pretty interesting. Um, you can just look at some of those. Um, you know, the idea that sex is expected if it's a hookup, but less expected if it's a date. Although apparently equally accepted whether it's a date or hangout. Um, the fact that people expect to eat on a date, um, but not necessarily on a hangout. 
but a little bit more people do expect to eat if they're hooking up. Um, less concern about your appearance if it's a hookup. Um, it, you know, if you're hanging out, there seems to be less of an expectation about kissing goodnight. Um, once again, that hookup versus date hangout distinction, making out isn't quite the same expectation, but calling and texting afterwards, right? You see people are more likely to expect that, you know, from a date than from a hookup. Um, but how would you know this? Um, and, and I think that's just Cohen's point, right? These social scripts are less set in stone than what they once were. And so we've talked about this in previous chapters, um, that dating itself um, has came, became the dominant mode of relationship formation uh, after the courting system or what we call the calling system. So we kind of went from, you know, if you're, if you're even just focused on the 20th century, you know, we kind of went from at the beginning of the century, the courting and calling system to the dating system. And then specifically the, the form of dating going steady became really predominant in, in the 50s. And then as Cohen notes, you know, this, uh, it, it becomes less common in the 60s and the 70s and, and moving forward. Um, and so, you know, I think that is that is kind of a, a observation here is that there isn't necessarily maybe a clear cut, cut dominant mode of relationship formation, particularly if you're focused on young adults, the way that there maybe was in the 1880s, in the 1920s, in the 1950s. Um, and so that demise of the dating system is one of the uh, uh, primary uh, script shifts that is focused on in this chapter. Um, the increasing acceptance of living together as a common stage in relationships um, is another kind of observation that's made. The incorporation of divorced and older singles into the mix of those looking for new relationships. And we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail later in the presentation. And then the continual adaptation of communication technology to relationship dynamics. And we definitely will come back and discuss that in further detail. So, you know, one way we can even just kind of begin talking about, you know, how dating has changed, um, how romance has changed, is if you even just kind of look at who people used to marry, um, you know, the fact of the matter is, is, you know, there used to be a strong um, uh, proliferation of marriages um, that happened within a few blocks of one another. Um, relatively speaking, very few people married people um, who grew up and were from different cities. Um, and you can kind of see that, you know, uh, obviously, um, technology has made the ability to have long distance relationships to even meet people initially who are not living close to you uh, much more likely and much more possible. And so, you know, just kind of, you know, looking at it over time, you know, the fact that uh, we have an increasing number of people, you know, obviously meeting online after the 1980s, um, we've had decreases in the number of people, um, number of couples who have even met in college. Um, and we'll maybe kind of talk about that a little bit more when we get to our section on hookup culture, um, you know, a decrease of number of people who met in church. Um, and that probably has something to do with shifts in religiosity and church attendance that we've seen in in this country uh, over the last few decades. Um, comparatively, if you look at same-sex couples, um, and, and this is something that comes up, and I'll come back to this, this point uh, later, but just because of the additional obstacles that can come with meeting someone, um, a, a same-sex partner, um, even more so than heterosexual couples, um, same-sex couples were early adopters of uh, technology that allowed people to meet and connect with one another uh, in an online setting, um, probably because they were able to identify as being uh, part of the community, um, which, of course, you know, made it easier to establish these romantic relationships than meeting someone out and about and not necessarily being sure of their sexual identity or their interest in a same-sex partnership. 
And so when we're talking, of course, about the role of uh, technology in all of this, you know, we're really talking about in the last few decades, um, because it wasn't just, um, you know, the development of computers that 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 really um, kind of uh, contributed to the increase of online dating. Um, but especially once we had the development of smartphones, right? So this idea that you could be connected to uh, people who were interested in a romantic relationship, not just by going to a website, but by downloading an app to your phone, right? So as much as the match.com and the eHarmony.com, you know, made a big splash, you know, in the, the 90s and the early aughts, of course, you know, the Tinders and the Bumbles and all of those spinoffs, um, you know, in more recent uh, times um, have become kind of the driving forces behind uh, the growing uh, tolerance uh, and proliferation of people meeting their partners uh, in online settings. So the second section on love, um, and this is the section where, um, you know, you get introduced to some concepts. And then in this section, I'm also going to introduce you to some additional concepts and, uh, and theories. Um, so this is a section where you do get some material that is outside of the textbook. So you might would like to pay attention closely and take good notes. So beginning with, you know, Cohen kind of gets into intimate relationships without really establishing like, why do we have intimate relationships in the first place? Um, and I think, you know, and there are a lot of different ways you can answer that, um, you know, and, and we talked about in chapter two, when we talked about the history of the family, you know, that people got married for very different reasons, um, you know, hundreds of years ago than what people get married um, you know, the reasons why people get married now, but it isn't even that back then that there wasn't necessarily a need um, for intimacy and a need for love. It's just the expectation that you were going to necessarily have that or find that in a marriage wasn't necessarily there. Um, but the idea that people needed people, that they needed to know that people cared about them, that there were people out there who loved them and were invested in them. If you uh, look at a psychologist, Maslow, um, you will see that in his hierarchy of needs, he places love and belonging like right there in the middle after you know, your basic physiological needs and your safety and security needs, um, although it's worth noting, he puts family in both security and the love and belonging. So uh, you, know, um, I, you can kind of think about um, that, that at least familial love um, as being a, perhaps an even more necessary building block than romantic love. But even if you're focusing on romantic love, if you're focusing on friendship and, and, and intimacy, it's right there in the middle, right? You know, people, people's ability to have self-esteem, people's ability to achieve self-actualization, you know, the higher levels of the hierarchy are somewhat uh, dependent on them being able to establish um, you know, that love, belonging, that sense of connection, that intimacy with other people before they can go on and necessarily have, you know, uh, confidence, um, you know, uh, meet their inner potential, you know, experience, you know, purpose in their life, right? They, 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 they do need, um, you know, this connection with other people uh, that you find through having friends and having uh, lovers, right? Um, so not just family where there is this sense of obligation, right? You need family for security purposes, but there is something additional that is to be gained when people who don't have to love you, who don't have to be connected to you, who don't have to, uh, you know, necessarily be invested in you, choose to love you, be connected to you, be invested in you through the role of friends or through the role of intimate, um, you know, uh, partners. So I want to talk a little bit about friends so I can build on that definition of friendship to talk a little bit more about love. So, you know, as I indicated, you know, friendship is important. Um, for a lot of us, you know, friends are the first real interpersonal relationships that we experience outside of our family. And unlike family, it doesn't necessarily come with that sense of obligation and duty, which, you know, gives us a, a sense of, of, of both choice, right? We're choosing these people um, as our friends, but also their acceptance of us, um, 
is it, 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 it feels different, right? Because at the same time we're choosing them to be our friend, they're choosing us to be a, a friend as well. So that connection is kind of built on, um, you know, a different type of foundation than the, the connection that we have with, you know, our siblings or our parents. So what makes someone a friend? Um, a textbook that I used to use, I can't even remember now what textbook that is, uh, they listed eight qualities of friendship. And, you know, you can, if I was teaching this in person, you know, we would oftentimes, um, you know, have this discussion, you know, can someone still be a friend without one of these characteristics? Um, but the eight, eight qualities are enjoyment, acceptance, trust, respect, mutual support, confiding, understanding, and honesty. Um, and like I said, you know, you can kind of go through each characteristic and think about like, hey, why is it important that a friend have, have this characteristic? And you can ask yourself, do I have friends that I genuinely think of as being friends, not acquaintances, not colleagues, you know, not, you know, um, you know, people that I, 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 I'm not close enough to, to consider to be friends. But, you know, if you have friends who don't necessarily meet these eight qualities, you know, I think it's worth just reflection, you know, that, you know, ask yourself, you know, how, you know, how do they not meet that quality? Why is that not necessarily important to you? Do you think it impacts the quality of the friendship if they don't have that quality? Um, like I said, this is always just a really good discussion that we have when I'm teaching this in person. Um, so now building onto this, you know, considering love, um, you know, one way we can start talking about love is can you love someone romantically if they are also not your friend? Um, so one way we can start thinking about love is in what ways is love uh, a, a, a romantic partner? an intimate partner, um, in what ways do they build on those friendship characteristics? And once again, from that unknown textbook, um, you know, they made the point that, you know, one way we can think about love is that it's everything from that friend list, right? Those characteristics, but then add in sexual desire, um, priority over other relationships, right? So you feel something for this person that is greater, that is different, that is more significant, that gives them a priority over uh, all of your other or most of your other uh, relationships. And then caring to the point of self-sacrifice. Um, and once again, you know, if this was an in-person class, this is always, uh, you know, one that we would debate, right? Because it's like, is that a reasonable expectation or is that a cultural expectation um, that we have been socialized to accept through like media and through, uh, you know, stories? Um, you know, can, should we expect our, 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 our romantic partner to care about us to the point where they are willing to, I don't know, um, jump in front of a truck to save us or something? Um, so, you know, if you buy into that uh, definition I said, right, that love uh, is, is our, you know, is the characteristics from the friend list plus these additional characteristics, it really complicates, you know, um, that love at first sight uh, uh, myth um, that we have in our culture. Um, because if that is your definition of love, how can you have those characteristics? How can you have things like acceptance and mutual support and confiding and understanding and trust, you know, with someone that you are just meeting? Um, you know, you certainly can have maybe sexual desire um, at first sight, but, you know, if, 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 if you believe that the definition of love you know, is, you know, is the characteristics from that list, um, plus these other things, then it, it's really hard to then, um, you know, uh, have that belief in that definition of, of love, and then a belief in love and first sight at the same time. Now, if you don't believe that the definition of love you know, is friendship plus these other things, then yeah, of course that opens you up to the idea that you could fall in love at first sight because it's not gonna be based on, um, you know, those characteristics that take a while to develop and grow. Um, and of course, none of this really addresses, you know, the idea of soulmates. Although once again, you know, just looking at that list, 
And then the additional things in the list, you know, is it really an impossibility that you can feel all of these things um, for only one person, right? You know, uh, or can you feel these things with multiple people if given time and space and opportunity? So all of these are just interesting things, I think, to kind of ask. Um, now, the definition from your book is really straightforward. Um, they define love as a deep affection and concern for one another with whom one feels a strong emotional bond. And then romantic love in particular, they describe as being a passionate devotion and attraction one person feels to another, right? So, you know, deep affection and concern, um, love. And so you can have that type of love for, you know, family members, for your friends, um, Romantic partners, once again, is that idea that in addition to this um, type of, of non-romantic love, that if it's a romantic love, you also have this passionate devotion and attraction that, you know, you're expected to feel. And so this is why if you're looking at what motivated people to marry um, in earlier time periods, or even like arranged marriages that in some cultures still take place even today, it's why it's maybe not quite surprising that, you know, after a, some years together, um, those spouses who did not necessarily experience romantic love and may never experience romantic love with one another oftentimes do report that they love one another, right? Because you can develop all those other characteristics. You can develop this affection and concern, um, even if that passionate devotion and attraction isn't there. Now, of course, um, you know, in American culture, um, it, it is that romantic love that we uphold as an ideal, and your your book talks about this in a lot of detail, right? Um, that this that romantic love, and especially the modern version of romantic love, has become this mythical ideal, um, according to Anne Swidler, who is a sociologist. You know, first of all, we believe it's unambiguous and clear, right? You know that you love someone, you know it right away, you're always very clear about your feelings for them. It is unique, right, in the sense that you could only feel this type of way uh, for this one person, right? Your love is unique for one another. Um, that people who are in love should seek to both prove and demonstrate um, by overcoming obstacles, right? So you should be willing to overcome obstacles. You should be willing to practice that self-sacrifice as a way to show how much you love. And then finally, it's this idea that it is love forever, right? That it's permanent. Um, and so, you know, if, if you... Think about romantic love through this idealized lens. Um, Swidler argues, you know, that, you know, our current structure of marriage reinforces this ideal because oftentimes, um, you know, adults uh, at a young age, um, I mean, that age has become increasingly a little less young, but, but still relatively young. You know, we expect people to make this choice to marry one person who we say is going to be their partner in loving harmony forever. Um, and, and so in this way, you know, instead of marriage being based on this idea of, hey, we're joining property, <laughs> um, hey, you look like you can bear me some children, hey, you look like you'll be a good provider, things that are less romantic, but are definitely more stable and logical. Now, of course, we get married, you know, um, on this basis of romantic love, um, which um, you know, obviously um, comes with some in inherent, uh, you know, problems and complications and contradictions. Uh, but this romantic love, um, you know, in our culture, it, it has its own social scripts, right? You know, we, we expect the relationships to progress in, in a certain type of way. We expect it to end with, you know, um, you know, at some point and, you know, you say, I love you, um, and, and, and the other person is supposed to say it back. And then your relationship intensifies even further and you meet family members and, and you, you know, you form form joint commitments with, with mutual friends and you spend the bulk of your time together. Um, and at some point there is still this social script that, you know, you're supposed to, to propose, right? That, that, that is what this romantic love is leading to. Um, and so this is where, like I said, this definition, this idolized um, kind of uh, perception of romantic love can sometimes, um, you know, 
it, it, it can form a rocky foundation for marriage um, because a lot of the aspects of romantic love isn't necessarily um, compatible with long-term relationships. It's expected to be permanent, but the aspects that make romantic love what it is are oftentimes aspects that just, you know, are not built to last in that same type of way, um, you know, those same types of feelings, you know, un un until death do you part. Um, because romantic love is passionate, it's intense, it's emotional, it can be melodramatic. Um, like I said, it, it's, it thrives on, on this belief, you know, that it's unambiguous, like you love that person at first sight, that fate is involved because it's unique, because you have this one person that your soulmate that you had to find. Um, and, 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 and as Swidler notes, you know, we now kind of set up our marital expectations, our cultural expectations around marriage, you know, around the idea that this is the type of love that people are supposed to experience that leads to marriage, right? Um, you know, it's no longer socially acceptable to say, hey, I'm marrying for money, um, unless you want to be called a gold digger, uh, or say like, hey, I'm marrying because, you know, her dad has a big farm that I want to join with my farm. You know, the types of things that would have been acceptable 200, 250 years ago, those aren't acceptable, socially acceptable reasons. They're not part of our social scripts now in regards to what is leading to marriage. Instead, what we say is, is, hey, you know, these are the types of feelings that you should have that propels your relationship forward. Um, and eventually you get engaged and then you get married. But the type of love that then lasts is different than this type of romantic love. And so this long-term love, um, some scholars refer to as what they call companionate love. And it's different from romantic love, you know, it's more demanding and less fun, right? You know, this is where you expect someone, you know, to do their share of the chores and to listen to you when you've had a bad day and to accept that you maybe always don't look your best or you may not always be up for sexual intimacy. Um, this type of love is more altruistic. It's more caring. Um, it's more giving. Companionate love is supposed to be able to grow and change over time. Um, don't worry about the, it may be more companion or storgic um, because I'm not going to hold you to um, that particular set of theories. And then finally, we know that long-term love, you know, oftentimes involves some key demographic factors, um, you know, some things related to how alike you and your partner are, you know, to what extent do you have shared demographic uh, characteristics as well as cultural values, um, as well as some other kind of demographic traits that kind of seem to, you um, be more likely to lead to long-term love, right? Being more financially stable, being a little older, um, you know, um, all of those types of things that aren't, they don't sound very sexy, they don't sound very romantic, but once again, as sociologists looking at empirical evidence, you know, we can see that this is the type of love that tends to last. Um, romantic love that does not evolve into companionate love, um, is it, it, it faces a much rockier uh, marital uh, tenure. Um, and so your book doesn't talk necessarily about companionate love so much as it talks about utilitarian love, which is an even more lo logical, uh, I think, version of companionate love um, because utilitarian love is practical and it's rational um, and it's the dedication of one person to another pretty much based on shared understanding and emotional commitment, right? So this is the type of love that your textbook notes drives people people to consider the pros and cons of different partners and to look within themselves and identify what they really want from a relationship, right? So this is the idea, instead of romantic love, where you might get caught up in the moment and, you know, swept up by, you know, these, 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 this attraction that you have or, or this unbelievable, like, connection you feel like you have, utilitarian love is much more logical. And you, instead, you're writing out your pros and cons list. And you're really thinking about, okay, who can I, who do I have the best chance of a long-term commitment with? Um, and there are some theorists that believe 
that even though romantic love um, still kind of remains the dominant script, particularly in media, particularly among younger generations, but that especially as people have gotten a little older um, and as, as they're getting married, as they're doing things like investing in their educations and careers, that, you know, not that they're not looking for romantic love, but this romantic love has become heavily tinged by utilitarian love. Um, and that love does need to have a certain amount of rationality, right? So, you know, if you're the type of person that has deal breakers with the, you know, the people you meet, if you're the type of person, you know, that makes the pros and cons list, um, you know, you are engaging in or you are looking more for utilitarian love um, than romantic love. You're looking more for, you know, what seems like who is going to be a safe, uh, a more safe and, and more secure um, uh, potential partner than necessarily, like I said, uh, you know, who is, you know, this great romantic, you know, getting swept off of your feet, um, despite all of their, you know, red flags or, uh, uh romantic, uh, pitfalls, um, you know, um, so that's, uh, as Cohen notes, uh, some, theorists say that because we become more rational as a society, utilitarian love uh, is, 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 is becoming more, more predominant, um, which is almost like throwback to like, you know, back when people were marrying for logical, rational reasons um, before, you know, love kind of um, conquered uh, marriage. So the next few slides are concepts, theories about how we can define love. What does love look like? How do people conceive of love? This is not your textbook, um, but it's information that I think is interesting, it's good to know. Um, so one way we can start thinking about love is that oftentimes some people claim that love has been feminized, right? Um, that when we shifted to, um, when we shifted to, romantic love as an ideal and a rom romantic love as being the social script that leads to marriage, um, you know, versus the more practical concerns that used to lead to marriage. Some people said around this time, you know, the concept of love, uh, which used to be much more heavily focused on duty and obligation and honor and respect, um, you know, it, it became feminized um, It focused more on emotions and, and, you know, um, sentimentality. Um, and one way that they, that for people that, that, that present this argument that love has become feminized, one way that they say that that's clear is because uh, instrumental displays of love are rarely seen as positively in modern society and, and, and culture as expressive displays of love. Um, so instrumental displays of love is when you do something to help someone um, because you love them, right? You know, you, you know, I don't know, change the oil in their car. Uh, you put the dishes, you know, you clear the dishes out of the dishwasher. Um, you, you, you know, you, you handle bath time for the kids, right? You do this act of service, um, you know, in order to make life better, easier, um, more accommodating for your loved one. Expressive displays are, you know, the love poems and sonnets and songs and the, the gushy texts, the Instagram or TikTok displays, um, you know, it's the sending flowers, it's the buying gifts, it's the elaborate proposals and hell, even prom promposals, right? It's this expressive display of this is how much I love you. Um, and so people say, you know, that is, it, that's now seen as being more demonstrative of love than instrumental displays. Um, and, um, and, and one way that this kind of divide between instrumental displays versus expressive displays has played out in popular culture is through the book, which you maybe have heard of, or you maybe have read an article or taken a quiz about love languages. Um, and so it's the idea that we all have this, we have this feeling love, right? But how we express love and how we perceive 
something as love can differ person to person. Um, and um, the, the author of the book compared it to, you know, if two people are in love, but one person is speaking a totally different language than the other, so let's say Spanish and Japanese, um, then they aren't going to be able to effectively communicate with their partner their love for one another. And so uh, the author builds on that, like, you know, if your love language is words of affirmation, um, which means, you know, you're big on communication and through the form of compliments and, af you know, and affirmations and kind words, um, you know, you, you like getting the, you know, thinking of you text and, um, uh, you know, the thoughtful cards on your birthday or on, you know, holidays, you know, if that's your love language, you may not understand if you are with someone who thinks, acts of service is, 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 is how they express love, right? Where they do things for you, right? They, you know, engage in acts of kindness, you know, they repair or do maintenance around the home. Um, they help you out, right? They, they focus on what they can do, like I said, to make your life easier. Um, and then the other three types, uh, you know, quality time, um, making sure that they schedule one-on-one -on -one time with you, that they have face-to-face -face conversations, that you do things together, that they make it clear that they're prioritizing um, your time. Um, you know, that person, if that's their love language, they might not appreciate a person who doesn't um, uh, provide them that one-on-one -on -one time, but perhaps buys a lot of gifts, right? Because if that person is enacting their love language, which is receiving gifts, um, you know, they're the type of person that puts a lot of thought into presence. They maybe give you gifts, you know, just because they certainly go all out on the typical gift giving holidays. And then finally, you know, physical touch, right? Um, you know, they're a hand holder, they give hugs, there's a lot of kissing and PDA. Once again, that's how they show love. If they have a partner who is not comfortable or as comfortable with physical touch, and perhaps they are one of those other love languages, that person may not feel like they are being loved. And so obviously, you know, the idea is that we all have a primary love language or a combination of a few, but it's this idea that there isn't necessarily a kind of dominant definition about what love is, which could lead to a lot of confusion about recognizing the love that someone is trying to give us. Now, another way of thinking about love, and this is from a more theoretical perspective, is uh, what's called the triangular theory of love. And so the triangular, triangular theory of love, um, it focuses on the idea that there are three important components of love. Um, and so those three components are intimacy, right? And in this case, intimacy is kind of meant to mean like you have a high level of, of, of mutual trust, um, that you can engage in self-disclosure, right? That you can be, you know, honest and, and your most honest and vulnerable self with this person because of your connection, because you trust that person, um, you feel comfortable with that person. So that's what intimacy means here. It doesn't mean the same thing as passion, right? So passion is more that, you know, sexual desire, sexual attraction. And then finally, decision and commitment. Um, that speaks to your loyalty to that person because you have decided that this is your person, that you are committed to being in a relationship with this person. So this is speaking to kind of, you know, a sense of obligation that you have, uh, you know, to this person in your life. And so the idea is that, you know, um, relationships can vary on, on, based upon the presence of or lack thereof of these three things, right? So a relationship that has all three, um, intimacy, passion, and commitment um, is, is called consummate love. And a relationship that lacks all three is called non-love. But then, you know, if you were to diagram this out, you know, what about um, a relationship that has intimacy and passion, but lacks commitment, or a relationship that has commitment, but lacks intimacy and passion. So if you were to actually, you know, do a little diagram, there are eight different outcomes um, that two people can have on the basis um, 
of these three components. And it's worth noting that this consummate love, right, this idea that in a perfect world that you would have all three, um, the authors of this particular theory noted that this isn't the type of relationship that most people have, including most people in marriages. Like, um, so you could potentially have a marriage, you could potentially have a long-term relationship, and it could even be um, you know, potentially, you know, satisfactory or satisfactory enough, um, even if it doesn't have all three of these components. Um, but certainly it's the idea that the best relationships, right, the relationships that most kind of meet the definition of love are the ones that have all three of them. And then the final theory that I'm introducing is one that if you are a psychology major, um, you probably have heard of, and it's attachment theory. And attachment theory kind of begins with the basis that our primary motivation in life is to be connected with other people, because that's, you know, it gives us security. It's, it's the security, um, you know, that we have, right? The idea that other people care about us, are invested in us, love us. Um, and attachment theory arises from the study of infant mother relationships. And kind of based on those quality of relationships, um, they get characterized in three ways. Um, infants that have a secure uh, attachment with their mother, um, you know, they know that because their mother is consistent um, in her caregiving, um, you know, she's, she's there um, um, when the infant, uh, you know, cries uh, or, you know, for, for the most part, make sure that the infant's needs are being met. Um, they, the, the mother interacts positively with the infant. The infant forms a secure attachment, um, which means that when the mother's not around, sure, the infant is upset initially, but they settle down um, largely because somewhere in their infant brain, they know that their mother is coming back. They are secure in the knowledge that their mother loves them and they will return. Um, and anxious, um, when a, well, let me say it like this, when a mother is inconsistent in her attentions, right? So sometimes she's holding and rocking, borderline smothering, um, you know, the baby. And then sometimes, you know, can't be bothered, you know, lets the baby cry, lets the baby, um, you know, the infant, you know, remain in a soiled diaper for a long period of time, you know, doesn't feed the, the infant promptly or on schedule. Um, what can happen is, is that the infant can form what's called an anxious ambivalent attachment. Um, and so this attachment um, can, can show up in infants in two ways, right? They can either be very anxious, right, about their relationship with their mother because they don't feel secure, which means when she leaves, because they aren't sure if she's coming back, um, you know, they cry the whole time, they're, they're, they're non-consolable, right? Because they are not secure in the idea that their mother is gonna be returning to them. Another way that a infant can respond to an inconsistent, erratic mother is through ambivalence, right? So because they have learned that their mother is inconsistent, um, her attentions are inconsistent. Sometimes she's very attentive and sometimes, um, you know, she's nowhere to be found. Um, and, you know, they basically learn that they need to be pretty ambivalent about her presence, right? Um, so they don't get very upset when she leaves, but they also aren't very, unlike secure um, or even anxious um, infants, they aren't necessarily super welcoming um, or super excited upon her return, right? So they've learned ambivalence as a strategy to cope with her inconsistency. Um, and then finally, when a mother is largely, you know, just, you know, not around, or when she is around, um, you know, she is pretty much, you know, consistently a negative presence, right? Maybe she yells, um, you know, or, you know, perhaps even engages in abusive behavior towards the, the child. Um, the, the relationship is then avoidant. Um, so when the mother leaves, um, the infant is almost relieved and you know that 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 they are no longer in their mother's presence and when the mother returns the infant is resistant um to greeting her or being back in her presence they instead try to avoid um you know interaction so from this this theory that was based upon of course like i said infant mother relationships other theorists have then extended it into 
um, you know, adulthood, you know, the idea being that, you know, um, adults who form secure attachments with their romantic partners, um, you know, they're confident and secure in the consistent attention that their, um, you know, partner shows them. So yeah, they're sad when they're not around, but you know, they're not like a crazy nervous wreck. Um, and because they know that their partner will return and then they are happy to be back in their partner's presence, um, you know, when when they're reunited. That anxious ambivalent, you know, is, is more likely when you have a lover who is hot coal, you aren't sure what version of them that you're gonna get um from interaction to interaction um and so what happens is is you know once again kind of like uh in the case of the the mothers and the infants um you have this uh you have this uh you know kind of bifurcated response where some people if they're dating that type of person they're just anxious all the time you know is this person thinking of me? What are they up to? Oh my gosh, I bet they, you know, met someone else. And of course, you know, in today's world where we now have all this technology, what that might look like is like calling all the time, texting all the time, asking them to check in with you all the time via text. And of course, when they do come back into your presence, you know, when they do call you back or when you do see each other again, it's that extreme relief, right? Because somewhere in the back of your mind, you, you were concerned that they weren't going to return to you. And the other one, of course, you know, the other kind of response to that type of hot, cold treatment is just to be ambivalent, right? You feel like, hey, this person can't be trusted to be consistent from day to day, from moment to moment. So I just can't let myself feel too deeply. I can't be too involved. I have to kind of keep this person at arm's distance. And, and so you aren't very invested in the relationship. You're ambivalent about the relationship because you feel like your partner is inconsistent. And finally, people who are avoidant, who have avoidant attachments and adults, um, you know, these are people who um, they avoid um, making attachments, right? Whether they're afraid that people are going to leave them, whether they're afraid that people are going to abuse them or mistreat them. You know, this is a person that walks around with their guard up, their walls up. They basically, you know, um, you know, they are basically detached from uh, personal relationships. So regardless of your definition of, of love, um, you know, the other kind of big question after what is love is, well, how do you find it? Or maybe a better question is, why do some of us find it and maybe some of us don't? Um, and as sociologists, we can think about this by kind of splitting it into macro factors, so large kind of societal level factors, and then micro factors, right, which are the individualistic factors that a lot of people normally turn to when explaining why some people find love and some don't. So, you know, macro factors, you know, so obviously they're mass society factors, right? So, um, you know, when, you know, nations are in crisis, you know, the, whether it's due to recessions or pandemics, um, you know, this is not normally a time period where people are very focused on 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 personal relationships and seeking out you know um long-term committed relationships um you know they're demographic factors right so uh you know if you are uh, part of a relate a racial or ethnic or religious minority group and there aren't a lot of people um, you know, who are members of your group in a given area, that might impact your ability to find love. Um, because we will talk about later how for certain groups, they are more or less likely to uh, date and marry outside of their race. So if they're in an area where there aren't a lot of people like them, um, then they might ultimately just be less likely to find someone that they fall in love with. Um, you know, other demographic factors, of course, is kind of the, uh, if you're talking about heterosexual relationships, is the uh, ratio of men to women. So we know, like, for instance, in China, um, because there was a generation uh, where under the one child policy, people didn't want to have daughters. So, you know, um, girls were, uh, they were, they were young, young girls, infants, you know, they were aborted. In some cases, they were born and killed and infanticide, female infanticide. Um, you know, they were shipped out of the country. They were adopted by, you know, they were given up 
uh, for adoption by their families and adopted by um, people outside of China. So then they, you know, didn't grow up there. And so it results, it resulted in uh, a fairly large, uh, you know, gender gap between uh, available men and available women. Um, so, you know, in that situation, if you're heterosexual, um, you know, that is a, uh, you know, that is a demographic factor. That is a macro level factor outside of your control. Then there are double standards, um, you know, for, for men and women, once again, just heterosexual relationships here. But, you know, um, the idea that men can date younger women is socially acceptable for men to date and marry younger women. And it's uh, less socially acceptable um, for women to date and marry younger men. So, you know, women have a much more narrow uh, dating market um, and a much more narrow range of, 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 you know, eligibility, I hate to say it that way, um, marketability um, within, within the, the dating market than, than men uh, necessarily do. Um, and this is, can become importantly true. Um, when people marry and then divorce at later ages. Um, and then uh, what oftentimes is, is, has been characterized as me first individualism. You know, as there's been this shift to kind of focusing on getting your own life together first, through, you know, and I'm not necessarily saying that's a bad thing, you know, focusing on education and career, building up your finances, maybe even buying a home on your own, but by focusing on that, as opposed to looking for a life partner or a committed partner, um, you know, that of course does sometimes mean that you miss out on, on, on finding love. Um, because by the time you then decide to focus on this, once again, you might find because of demographic factors, because of the double standard, um, and, and, and of course, you can also just think about the double standard of, you know, it being more uh, acceptable for men to date a lot of women while women have to date, you know, it's expected that women are going to be more monogamous um, and more sexually modest. Um, you know, all of that can just lead to some people maybe finding love and finding a, a, a life partner and some not. Oftentimes we don't talk about the macro factors. We focus on the micro factors, right? We focus on personality characteristics like, hey, you know, what makes you potentially a hard person to date or love? Um, you know, why do people, you know, break up with you or not want to be with you, right? We focus on those types of personality characteristics. Are you dishonest? Are you selfish? Are you shallow? Um, another kind of uh, micro level characteristic um, or actually more meso level is, is like family characteristics, right? Um, you know, are there, are there traits in your family that are less desirable um, that, that might make people, um, you know, that might make you less open to love? Um, and it's also, you know, that might make you less desirable of a partner for people, right? You know, maybe your parents, you know, have both have, you know, multiple divorces um, a piece. And, you know, that's made you very, uh, nervous about the idea of commitment, or it makes other people nervous about, you know, the idea that you can commit. Um, you know, maybe you were raised in a family where you got some, uh, you know, uh, really strict messages about, you know, dating and who's who's appropriate to date and 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 how appropriate is it to behave. And those messages aren't really in keeping with, you know, larger cultural social scripts, which makes you kind of a dating outcast. Um, so all of these types of things you know, kind of get to that, that question, why do some of us find love and why do some of us don't? Um, and, and certainly this, and once again, uh, before I get into relationship rituals, you know, this really just, just uh, complicates um, that myth, right, that we all have a soulmate, that, you know, there's someone out there for each of us, right? Culturally, that is something that we say, but once again, empirically, that isn't something that we see necessarily play out, um, you know, in research. Um, you know, there are people who don't find their person. There are people who don't experience what we, we call real love, um, you know, romantic love, definitely consummate love. And, so, and there are plenty of people who, even if they experience love, it doesn't necessarily last a lifetime. It doesn't lead to marriage or does lead to marriage, but the marriage doesn't necessarily last a lifetime. So, you know, once again, um, sociology out there just, uh, 
complicating and contradicting some of the things that we see in movies and TV shows and we hear in song lyrics and we read in books, um, you know, our romance novels um, about the subject. So we begin this section on romantic rituals by defining romantic relationships. You know, if you've ever had the, where is this going? Are we in a relationship conversation with someone? You know that um, oftentimes the definition isn't very precise and, and your book notes that. Although they give you this definition, it's mutually acknowledged ongoing interactions featuring heightened affection and intensity. Um, they note that modern relationships aren't as precise as relationships in previous time periods because um, due to changes in cultural values, due to changes in technology, due to changes in social scripts, they sometimes don't have fixed beginning, beginnings or ends. And sometimes even the language used by the participants um, isn't very clear. It, it makes it hard to note like, hey, is this a romantic relationship or not? And so, you know, part of this is as is, is an outcome of that shift from courtship to dating. And if this slide looks familiar, it's because I have discussed it before um, in chapter two. Um, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it here, but, you know, under the courtship system, you know, because men were coming into women's homes with the express permission of her parents, it was a lot more intentional. Um, and there was some expectation that there was an, an implied uh, long-term commitment there. Like you wouldn't be calling on a woman if you weren't interested in her being your potential mate. But, um, you know, at the turn of the century and definitely as we entered into the 1920s, um, the dating system replaced the courtship system. And at least under that original dating system, um, now, of course, you had uh, multiple potential partners. Um, there isn't the parental supervision and the expectation that all of the, that these dates are necessarily, um, you know, um, leading to a long-term commitment um, isn't necessarily there anymore. And as your book notes, you know, um, the uh, courting was a public matter that took place in a private setting. Dating was now more of a private matter between individuals. You know, it wasn't about that kind of public expectation. Hey, these two people are together and they're probably going to be married soon. Um, that's no longer there, even though the dating itself is taking place in a public arena. Um, the dating system, you know, like I said, kind of peaked in the in the fifties. Um, and it did become a little bit more serious and more commitment uh, latent um, with the going steady practice. But then beginning in the, the late 60s and in the 70s escalating, you know, the, the dating system began to decline. Um, today, when people use the word date, Cohen notes, it's more likely in reference to a single event, um, which... Uh, you know, is defined by a certain combination of goals shared by the participant, um, having fun, pursuing a sexual attraction, learning more about the other person with the possibility of a romantic relationship. Um, but then confusingly, we also still use the term dating when people have formed a more stable romantic relationship. So, you know, his, his basic point is, is just semantically, this is confusing because dates aren't necessarily, um, you know, predicated upon the idea that, hey, we're in a commitment, you know, a committed relationship, or even we are definitively working towards a committed relationship. But then we do use the term dating to describe people who have such a relationship. Um, and so, you know, the whole point in this book is that in a lot of ways, dating is difficult to generalize, especially if you're talking about like younger uh, uh, people, teenagers, young adults. Um, it, 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 it becomes especially difficult to, to generalize because they are less likely to use, you know, use this, this dating terminology. What we can say about dating based upon um, data collection um, and research is that age, education, and marital status affect romantic behavior and attitudes. Race and ethnicity um, certainly come into play. Um, peer groups, because they're racially or ethnically uh, segregated, 
um, more often than not, even, even in today's society. What that means is, is different behavior patterns and expectations about relationships can um, exist between different groups. So all of this is just explaining why there is no longer this dominant script in regards to dating. Now, one thing that I noted is that you know, part of the confusion is we have kind of moved beyond um, you know, the traditional dating um, uh, system, um, you know, it culminated with the going steady. But now we kind of have this contemporary dating and it's not just, you know, that the goals are different, but the language can be very different. It can be everything from hanging out to getting together, hooking up, which we'll talk about more later. Um, you know, you go together. Um, you know, this vague language comes with vague definitions, um, which means it's hard to necessarily assess, like, are people on the same page about what this relationship is, what they expect from it and where it's going. Oftentimes the people in the relationship aren't on the same page. And certainly for people trying to research it, um, you know, uh, as researchers, it's especially hard to, uh, you know, make proclamations about how dating works um, in today's society with younger generations um, because there is all this vagueness. Now, one aspect of dating culture that has been especially uh, emphasized and focused on in the last like decade um, has been the hooking up phenomena. Hooking up is defined as a casual sexual or romantic encounter without explicit commitment or exclusivity. Um, it's worth noting that hooking up can include all forms of sexual interaction, but it doesn't necessarily have to involve intercourse um, in order for it to be considered a hookup. And so uh, Cohen um, references sociologist Lisa Wade, um, who wrote a book about hookup culture, which I have taught in previous classes. So I have graphs from her book. Um, um, which kind of illustrates some points, um, you know, that she makes about hookups and hookup culture. Um, and, and the first point being is that there is some expectation that there is going to be some type of physical, um, physical interaction on a hookup. Um, unlike necessarily a date where you can be like, okay, we're gonna go on a date and I may not even, you know, give you a, a, a hug at the end of the night, let alone a kiss. You know, if, if it's understood to be a hookup, um, there is some expectation that some type of physical, um, you know, uh, uh, activity is gonna take place. But she notes that oftentimes we think hookups means definitively having sex. And as you can see, a uh, little over half in her study uh, involves intercourse. Um, but, you know, that means that certainly not all, you know, um, a little under half did not. Um, and those, you know, might have only involved things like kissing or, or fondling. Um, Another kind of point, and, and, and it's worth noting that her research is based on college students, you know, another kind of point is, is you know, how well do people know one another? Um, and, and, and once again, you know, I think this goes against expectation where people think people are hooking up with strangers. And although, you know, there, there was this slightly increased likelihood that people would hook up with someone they just met, but not necessarily take someone they just met on a date. But it's worth noting that a lot of things, you know, a lot of hookups were previous hookups. Um, a lot of hookups were already friends or know each other from school. So it's more like instead of hookups being dramatically different from dating, it's more like a divergent path from dating. Um, although, you know, if you read her book, she also notes that sometimes hookups become relationships. She calls it reverse dating, right? Where you start off as a hookup, but then it, it develops into something more committed. Um, although that is not a guarantee. Um, and, and, and her research made it clear that it was not, uh, you know, a, a, a that was not necessarily a safe, if, if, if that's how you were trying to get out of a relationship, she made it clear that that maybe wasn't the safest path um, to take. Um, and so, you know, obviously it's worth noting that a lot of people who hook up is because of sexual attraction, um, as opposed to uh, for dating, um, yes, people date because of sexual attraction, but people 
you know, college students date also because they want a relationship. And as you can see there, you know, although some people who engaged in hookups wanted a relationship, um, that was much less likely than, than, than people who went out on a date. And then, you know, and, and, and Cohen does note the, the role of alcohol in this chapter, but being drunk or drunk and or high was definitely more likely to be an element in a hookup and less so of a date. And, and like I said, Cohen does discuss this, that um, a common heterosexual hookup script starts with pregame drinking before a party and then at a party, you know, the intoxicated men and women dance on the dance floor. It involves a lot of grinding um, and then some kind of sexual interaction, although not necessarily sexual intercourse, takes place privately. Um, and then and, and what he's doing here is he's recounting uh, the observations that that Wade is making in her book. Um, and then he says she he reports um, based on her work that one kind of component of hooking up that we don't see with dating is that the hookup participants often engage in work to establish that the interaction was meaningless, right? That it was no feelings involved. Um, but even just these general descriptions, you know, it's noted can't capture the full range of emotional uh, you know, interactions that people may experience, um, you know, in the midst of engaging in a hookup, particularly if it's a, a, a hookup partner that they hook up with more than once. Um, because as Wade later notes, there are, there's definitely the risk of catching feelings. Sometimes it's mutual and sometimes it's not. When it's mutual, it might evolve into a relationship, you know, which she notes is, is what she calls backwards dating. Um, when it's not mutual, you know, this is where people can find themselves experiencing, you know, some real kind of emotional uh, harm and trauma from the hookup experience. Of course, another big risk of the hookup experience and hookup culture, um, because it is so reliant upon um, the role of alcohol and drugs within the script, um, alcohol and drugs, of course, also increases the likelihood of um, being sexually assaulted. Um, and, and, and Cohen does note that, um, that particularly uh, in college sexual assaults, uh, alcohol uh, and drugs um, were oftentimes um, uh, elements um, within the assault. Um, and and, and uh, with some uh, perpetrators even kind of victim blaming, um, you know, the victims that if they weren't that drunk or if, if they didn't want to have sex, you know, why did they get that drunk? Um, so all of that just kind of, you know, suggests that, you know, hookup culture, um, you know, uh, this is part of why hookup culture has been of such uh, empirical interest, I think, to a lot of social scientists, because uh, people are very split, researchers are very split, right, you know, is this like a sexual, like, progressiveness um, that's better than being sexually repressed, which we saw in previous generations, or is it harmful um, in, in various ways? And so the first of the articles that I'm suggesting that you read for this chapter is about hookup culture, and I know that I suggested a previous article um, in our sexuality uh, chapter um, about hookup culture. Um, this is not the same article. Um, so this article is from Psychology Today and it's really just kind of getting at, you know, is hookup culture kind of the dominant social script um, when it comes to romantic and sexual intimacy on college campuses? So I think it's pretty interesting and um, he does provide empirical evidence, um, you know, to kind of support his claims. Um, so, uh, I, I encourage you slash require you to read it um, and to kind of ask yourself, did you find his argument compelling or with merit? Um, so, you know, um, as Cohen notes, you know, we focus on hookup culture, but it's not like hooking up as all college students do. Um, a lot of college students also engage in dating. Um, and as, as they note, contrary to the notion that dating is over, um, at least 90% of students, according to a Stanford University survey, said they had been on at least one date. So, you know, you know people are still out there dating. Um, despite the spread of egalitarian beliefs, a lot of students um, in heterosexual relationships still expect the men to take the lead in formal date situations to ask the woman out on the date. Um, 
research also shows that men are more likely to have a, sex, a sexual goal um, when going out on a date, while women were more often um, to see it as a pathway to developing a romantic relationship. Uh, another focus in this, this section is on, like I said, the rise of online dating. So the first major national singles database um, was Match.com, and it was created in 1995. Um, and after that, you know, all types of competing sites popped up. Um, and some of them were, you know, focused on specific factors like race and ethnicity, J-date, um, you know, Black people meet, um, age, um, I think it, there was, it was called like it's our time or something, um, local area, farmers only, um, religion, Christian mingle. Um, and so, you know, as this competition popped up, as it became more common, as it became a more acceptable social script, you can see that um, more and more people engaged in this form of dating. Um, and so it is, it has, as your book note, it's risen rapidly. Um, and like I said, as we've transitioned from websites to smartphone apps, um, it's become even more common. So now um, one in four young adults um, use online dating. Um, and so your book notes, there are benefits and drawbacks here. Um, and a lot of this is just straight from your book. Um, you know, it's an easy opportunity to pursue romantic partners, um, definitely more efficient than in person. Um, it allows people to overcome so social isolation and search for a partner. So especially like if you're in an area where there aren't a lot of people in your dating pool um, for demographic reasons, or if you're a sexual minority, as I, I mentioned at the start of this lecture, you know, this is a, a beneficial way for you to kind of overcome your, you know, limitations in terms of who is in your actual, uh, you know, proximity, your actual geographic proximity, and it allows you to kind of take advantage uh, of a wider market. Um, drawbacks, um, you know, obviously uh, you risk exposure to, you know, unsavory, unscrupulous people, people who may be uh, dishonest. Um, and, and if they focus here about, you know, dishonest, you know, relationships with children and adolescents, and of course that's horrible, right? You know, that is, um, you know, and not just horrible, but also illegal. Uh, but, you know, even if you are an adult, um, you know, people can lie and, and present themselves dishonestly and be dishonest about what they're looking for, you know, on the internet um, and, and via technology a lot easier necessarily than what they would be, you know, in person, um, you know, so there is this issue with misrepresentation, right? Um, you know, that's, how, that's why we've gotten so many seasons of that uh, TV show, Catfish. Um, so in, in light of that, um, I, I give you a, 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 a short, interesting little article um, that is identifying the top deal breakers for online dating. Um, and they're referencing a lot of, you know, sociologists and what they found in their research, you know, what the research um, they conducted revealed about uh, deal breakers. So, you know, read it and, and, you know, maybe note if there were any deal breakers that surprised you. And, you know, this is a little dated in 2016. So do you think the information in this article is still true? Or do you think some preferences have shifted? Um, are some deal breakers back then no longer deal breakers now? Um, another shift in the, the, the um, uh, dating ritual script um, that Cohen notes, of course, is the number of older singles and single parents who are now in the dating market. Um, so, of course, you know, um, and there's several reasons for this. So, for older singles, it's because of, you know, the fact that so many people um, get divorced and, you know, post divorce, it's not like they just say, hey, I'm never going to find love again. Let me live alone until the day I die. Um, but they re enter the dating market um, in some cases with the expectation that they will find another partner um, that, that they will experience love with and marry. Um, the other kind of reason why we have older singles is because people are living longer. Um, and so in some cases, it's not even that they divorce, but they outlive their partners. Or in some cases, people are living longer. And if they never married, um, you know, they find their person later in life um, because that person is now divorced or widowed. Um, and so 
So that is a change comparative to previous generations. And another change, of course, is single parents. So we have more people who are single parents, um, mothers and fathers. Um, the, the acceptance around being a single parent has increased. So it's not like people are, are necessarily feel social pressure to marry the parent of their child. Um, and if they are, and if they don't marry, um, the other parent of their child, then that means that they might still therefore be open and out there looking for someone to love and to marry. Um, and so, um, you know, so all of that just means that, you know, who is in the dating market, um, who is in the dating arena is a much more diverse range of people um, than, than, than previous generations. And then finally, um, in, in regards to, um, you know, gays, lesbians, bisexuals, pansexuals, um, it's not that they weren't in the, 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 uh, dating market, uh, in generations, um, past, but it was more like because of the lack of acceptability around um, LGB relationships, um, you know, they were more likely to be closeted or they were more likely to be extremely, you know, limited in their ability to seek out partners because it was so much more risky um, because, you know, their relationships were deemed um, unacceptable. So as that stigma has diminished and as the social acceptability around these relationships in has increased, this means that people feel more comfortable coming out at younger ages and therefore are a much more uh, visible presence um, in the dating arena. And all of that brings us to um, the the kind of last part or last major section which is on mate selection right so you know um now that we've talked about rituals now that we've talked about the de definition of love and theories related to love we've talked about you know why some people find it and why some people don't let's narrow in a little bit more uh specifically on that process um from the sociological point of view so you know, we use that the term mate selection. And this is the process by which people choose each other for sexual or romantic relationships. And it's one of the first steps of family formation, um, even today, although there are, you know, as, as we note, there are multiple ways to form a family. Um, this is still kind of the most common, most normative way. Um, and so understanding the process of mate selection is necessary for explaining at least three ways that family can influence society. Um, so mate selection um, plays into the uh, inequalities that we have in society. Um, and that's because, you know, first of all, there's this strong tendency um, and we talked about this when we talked about social class in chapter four, but there's this like strong tendency for people to marry within their class. Um, and so if rich people marry each other and poor people marry each other, then in this way, um, you know, class persistence, um, you know, exists. Um, and, and poor families remain po poor and rich families remain rich, right? So we have this kind of social closure where there isn't a lot of intermixing in between these, uh, you know, these classes, these stratification levels. And, and we'll talk a little bit more about endogamy, like, like with like um, on an upcoming slide. Um, another way mate selection, you know, factors into society is through uh, inclusion and exclusion. Um, so uh, mate selection can contribute to patterns of social inclusion, right? You know, what groups are people um, included in, um, you know, um, whether it's churches, whether it's country clubs, whether it's, you know, elite colleges. Um, and then what type of people aren't included in, or welcomed in those spaces? And what does that mean for their overall mate selection? Um, so in many ways, inclusion and exclusion kind of goes hand in hand with inequality. And then all of those things combined, you know, kind of factor into family dynamics, right? Um, because mate selection influences family dynamics, how stable the marriage is, how the family functions overall, how the children are raised. Um, the general health and well-being of all the family members, um, all of that kind of relates, you know, goes back to who did you choose to marry? 
So, you know, you, there's this part of the chapter where Cohen talks about the evolution of human sexual attraction. I don't have a lot to add here. Um, you know, he kind of just talks about um, how, first of all, what we consider to be attractive is, you know, uh, really has less to do about nature and it has more to be, do about nurture and culture and socialization that the definition of what's considered attractive, you know, varies across time and it's, it varies across place from society to society. Um, and because of this variation is why sociologists don't really buy into that whole evolutionary um, arguments um, in regards to attraction. And he has this whole interesting thing where he kind of applies this to high heels. I think it's interesting. Um, that's why I have a slide on it. Um, but uh, this video is already getting a little long and my voice is definitely getting a little scratchy. Uh, so uh, because I don't have much to add here, I'm just going to kind of direct you to, uh, you know, pay attention to, you know, what's, uh, you know, the, what the reading has to say about this. Um, and, and the, the points from the reading that I highlight here, you know, on the slide. Where what I do want to use my voice on um, is, is this kind of wrap up about, you know, how do you decide who to date? And, you know, particularly how sociologists talk about this, um, because there are a lot of terms, some of which pop up in this book, some of which don't. Um, so one, one set of terms um, that pops up in this book is endogamy and, 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 and um, its opposite exogamy, um, which also can be referred to as, as heterogamy, heterogamy, heterogamy. I'm, I'm, I'm tired and I'm tripping over my words. Um, but all of this is really just a way of saying, does like marry like, um, does like date like, um, and, and that's in regards to ethnicity and race, it's regards to religion, it's regards to age, um, or do opposites, right? Um, um, are, are opposites being uh, partnered together, you know? And so that would be your, your interracial marriage, your, um, you know, your two different religions, um, people of varying uh, age groups, um, particularly, if you're talking about social class, you can talk about it in terms of hypergamy versus hypogamy um, with the idea that, you know, and, and I talked about this when I said, you know, that oftentimes people will date and marry within their social class, but um, if they if they are dating outside of their social class and they're dating or marrying someone of a higher social class, we, we call that hypergamy, right? Um, but if they're the person that's dating someone outside of their social class and that's a lower social class, we call that hypogamy. Um, and uh, there are very, there, I almost included a reading about this because there have been several interesting articles that have come out lately um, about, you know, the kind of uh, issues that people um, have to confront when they are dating someone of a different social class. Um, uh, and we haven't necessarily focused on, um, you know, dating someone of a different social class uh, as much as we focused on, research is focused on, of course, you know, dating someone of a different racial or ethnic group. Another kind of factor that can decide who you date is propinquity, which is a fancy way of basically saying, you know, how close are they, right? Um, and, and that was kind of that opening, um, that graph that I, I started this lecture off with, right? So in the past, um, you know, when there wasn't technology, when, uh, you know, air travel wasn't a possibility and later when it was a possibility, but it was very expensive, you know, obviously people like dated, fell in love and married people that, you know, grew up right down the block um, or a few blocks away. Um, now, of course, with technology, you can possibly meet up and or you can you, you can connect with someone uh, across the country, across the world even, and, and can develop a relationship with them. And there's all this technology and there are these advances in, in travel uh, that make this a possibility. Um, in, in addition to what uh, Cohen says about physical appearance and attractiveness, um, I'd like to add the fact that oftentimes, um, psychologically, one reason that people who are considered to be kind of stereotypical, you know, attractive for that 
given culture, you know, another reason why they fare better in the dating market is there is this psychological phenomenon called the halo effect, where we believe that pretty people aren't just prettier, they aren't just more attractive, but we also um, attach to them a lot of other traits unrelated to um, appearance. Um, but we believe that, you know, they're, they're smarter. We believe that they're more likable. We believe that they are more trustworthy. We believe that they're more generous, right? We have these kind of um, uh, more positive uh, associations um, in regards to personality and characteristics. We believe they're more successful. Um, we believe they're healthier. You know, we, we have these positive associations with attractive people um, and, 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 and we call it the halo effect, right? Um, and we don't necessarily have those same type of strong associations with people who are unattractive. If anything, we might be more likely to associate them with negative uh, aspects and personality traits that go beyond appearance. And then obviously just looking once again at micro kind of, you know, micro uh, factors that, you know, play into, um, you know, factor into who you decide to date, you know, obviously their values and personality. Um, now, in terms of theory, I would like to remind you of the social exchange theory that came up in chapter one, you know, and, and this is that, you know, and this also kind of relates to utilitarian love, you know, it's this idea that you look at your relationships through this cost benefit analysis, right? So you kind of weigh, you know, what people bring to the table versus what drawbacks that they might have. And you kind of think, you know, okay, I can compromise on this, but, you know, these are my deal breakers. And, you know, I'm looking for a person to specifically improve my life in this way, or specifically to not detract, you know, from my life in this way. Um, and then you, and you consider like, you know, how, what you bring to the table. Um, and, and so that's social exchange theory. Equity theory, when implied to relationships, is this idea that you, uh, you want your relationships to be as equitable as possible, which means that you are kind of looking for someone who, at least in terms of resources and, 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 and traits, you know, brings a lot of the same things to the table that you do. So, um, you know, oftentimes if a person is approaching their relationship from equity theory and they want somebody, you know, that makes roughly the same amount of money they do, that has the same type of educational background they do, has the same level of commitment to athletics or the same level of commitment to spirituality, religion that they do, the result of a lot of, 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 of relationships that where people are kind of thinking about their relationships using this equity theory mindset is that the relationship is going to be endogamous. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's going to probably result in a relationship with a person who is a light, a lot like you, um, in a lot of ways. Um, and then that final part that asks, you know, what are the most important qualities in a mate? Does this differ by gender? This is once again, one of those types of interesting discussions that we have when we are face to face and um, doesn't make much sense for me to attempt um, by myself uh, on video. So your book goes into a little bit more detail about endogamy and, and the role that, you know, um, policy has played and how utilitarian love with that focus on, on, on cost benefit analysis can sometimes reinforce endogamy. Um, and ro while romantic love, um, because it challenges a rational basis for, for love, uh, is, 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 is less likely to, to, um, well, I won't say less likely, but certainly um, if a relationship is, is, is between partners that are different, exogamy, then it's highly likely that they are going to discuss and define their love in more romantic love terminology than utilitarian love terminology. Um, another concept that comes up um, is homophily. Um, and once again, that's, you know, anytime you see that word endo or, 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 or homo as the kind of prefix, you just know that, you know, they're referring to interactions, they're referring to relationships um, between similar people versus dissimilar people. So you had a, a whole animation um, about how, you know, 
like, you know, for all groups, there is this preference for like versus like, but then also if you look at racial preference um, and ethnic, racial ethnic preference for dating outside of your race, as they note, there are some other kind of clear cut um, takeaways um, about what groups are least likely to be favored um, in the dating scene, in the dating market, um, when, when it's people outside of their racial ethnic group. Um, and so Cohen talks about the survey of Stanford students. He also talks about how this might play out in online dating where, you know, technically online, you would think that you would not necessarily have this preference for endogamy, right? Cause you, you know, theoretically um, could be more open to dating people or at least meeting people, communicating with people who are different from you, but instead, um, you know, although online dating could promote this greater mixing, um, you know, early research seems to confirm that racial ethnic boundaries still remain an issue in online dating. Um, and, you know, I give you two videos. Um, one's a little bit more cut and dry. One's a, a, the other one's a little bit more of an exciting stylized video, but it really just makes the point that, you know, some racial groups um, are more or less likely to receive um, uh, communication from people outside of their group um, than other racial groups. And, and of course, once again, just kind of going back to the, you know, one of the points of this chapter, you know, this is what we mean when we say mate selection um, can contribute to inequality, mate selection can contribute to social exclusion, mate selection can contribute to uh, you know, the likelihood of specific family structures and family dynamics. So um, I do have this, uh, you know, uh, piece from the Stanford Daily. It's a little older at 2015, but it just does talk about, you know, um, class endogamy and um, dating apps. Um, and, you know, with the author making the point that, you know, dating apps, some dating apps are set up in such a way that it encourages people to date people of their same class group. And this, you know, this is particularly true from people who are upper, upper middle class, right? These, you know, the league and uh, Raya, you know, these, these elitist dating apps. Um, and so, you know, it just raises the point that, you know, if we encourage people to date within their class group and then they fall in love and form families with people of the same class group, this is part of how we get class persistence. And, and ultimately, do you think society is improved um, you know, or not um, by uh, people engaging in this type of dating practice. And so I end with the trend to watch, which Cohen identifies as being, you know, sex before relationships. This came up in the sexuality chapter that, you know, uh, most people have sex now before um, being married. Um, but now, you know, Cohen notes that, especially with this backwards dating, the hookup culture, um, more relationships are starting with fairly early sexual encounters. So, you know, one question for researchers is, does that change the relationship in the long run? You know, is this just a kind of progression on the sexual revolution that, you know, goes back to the 1960s? You know, could this be a contributing factor to, you know, why we're seeing a rise of people getting divorced at older ages? Um, you know, does sex before a relationship help people make better decisions about whether or not to get into a serious relationship? Or does it in fact maybe hinder um, relationship formation in such a way? So that is the interesting um, kind of trend to watch that Cohen ends on. Um, and, and that is what uh, this video ends on as well.